Welcome to Peacemaking in Paris, presented by Professor Sir Hugh Strawn for UCL Institute of Education. This series marks the centenary of the Peace Conference in 1919, when the United States and Allied powers met in Paris to decide the terms of the peace settlements with the defeated Central Powers. I'm Simon Bendry, Director of UCL Institute of Education's First World War Centenary Battlefield Tours programme. In an earlier podcast series, From Amiens to Armistice, Sir Hugh looked at the sequence of Allied victories from the Battle of Amiens on the 8th of August 1918 to the armistice negotiated by Germany on the 11th of November 1918. In Peacemaking in Paris, he reflects on the peace conference and its legacy. In the final podcast of the series, he looks at the imperial interests of Japan and the ways in which the First World War enabled Japan to further its imperial ambitions in mainland Asia and in the Pacific. Japan's emergence as a great power was embodied in the views of many by its alliance with Great Britain in 1902. In that year, Britain had marked its end of isolation, the moment when it recognised that it might depend on other countries across the world in order to shore up its own global and imperial position. Despite that commitment, when the First World War broke out in 1914, the response of the British Foreign Office was not to engage with Japan and not to involve Japan in the war going on within Europe. If Britain had a threat that it had to confront in East Asia, it was the threat from Russia, which was now its ally, not the threat from Germany. That resolve collapsed very quickly because the threat that Germany presents in the Pacific is a maritime threat. Germany had established a major naval base on the Chinese coast at Tsingtao on the Shantung Peninsula in 1897. This was the base for the German East Asiatic Squadron, which on the outbreak of war went to sea to disrupt Britain's maritime communications and of course the import of goods from the Far East to the United Kingdom. The concentration of the bulk of the Royal Navy in the North Sea left the Royal Navy short of ships to police those lines of communication. So suddenly, the Navy needs Japanese naval support. For Japan, this is a twofold opportunity. First of all, for the Navy specifically to assert its place in Japanese defense. It has lain under the shadow of the army thus far. And it's an opportunity to eliminate Germany as a power within China. Japan's concern is not so much to fight Germany as a continental European power. Its concern is to use the excuse of a war with Germany to enhance its standing on the Asiatic mainland within China. So on the 23rd of August 1914, Japan declares war on Germany. Germany specifically, not on Germany and its allies. And Japan contributes to this war, not just by the use of its ships, but also by the use of its army. It sends troops to attack Tsingtao, to attack the German naval base, and they, in conjunction with British troops, very quickly capture Tsingtao, and so eliminate the German hold on the Asiatic mainland. These ideas of Japanese expansion find their roots in the Meiji Restoration of 1868. That was the year in which the emperor reasserted his authority by committing Japan to a program of modernization and centralization. The intention was to make Japan an effective actor able to deal with external powers in a way that it had not been able to do before. The army was a key element within this. Much of the effort of modernization was directed towards the army. Japan introduced universal conscription. It adopted Western methods of fighting and Western equipment. And it used that army to expand its influence in mainland Asia. Japan fought two wars. The first was the war with China in 1894 to 1895. And that war gave Japan control of Taiwan It also gave it treaty port status. The great powers of Europe in the 19th century had effectively established a system of informal empire within China, monopolizing Chinese trade. And as a result of its victory, Japan got access to those treaty port arrangements. The second war was the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 
1905, a war which marked Japan's emergence as a major military power. Russia, after all, was one of the great powers of Europe with the largest army of the day, and it is defeated in the Russo-Japanese War. As a consequence of its victory, Japan gets control of Manchuria. Japan's contribution to the naval war in 1914 gives it control of Germany's North Pacific colonies, just as it gave Australia and New Zealand control of Germany's South Pacific colonies. And it enables the Navy to become a significant political player within Japanese government. But the army still remains the dominant force within Japan, and the army's interests are, of course, not maritime, but continental. In other words, they lie in China, not in the North Pacific. And it is in China, during the rest of the First World War, that Japan concentrates the bulk of its expansionist effort. In 1911, China had undergone a revolution. The Manchu dynasty was toppled, the empire ceases to exist, and a republic is established under the control of its president, Yuan. In 1913, Yuan, anxious to consolidate his authority as the president of the new republic, accepted a loan from the treaty powers, which included Japan, in order to buoy up his own domestic authority. But in some respects, the decision to go for this loan actually undermined his authority because Chinese nationalists, the Kuomintang, were infuriated by this increasing dependence on Western imperialism and looked instead to Japan, another Asiatic power, for support. Sun Yat-sen, who was the leader of the nationalists, had strong connections with Japan. Japan is therefore able to play both sides of this debate, the Republicans on the one hand and the nationalists on the other, provoking dissension and division in a country which actually has many other players than just those two groups. In January 1915, Japan presents China with what are called the 21 demands. The demands are grouped into demands, things which are essentially unconditional from Japan's point of view, and wishes which could be seen as negotiable. The four demands that matter are, first of all, that Japan should have the right to settle what will happen to Tsingtao, to the former German colony, when the war is over. The second is that Japan should have control of iron and coal resources within China. The third is that Japan's hold on Manchuria should be consolidated and extended into Inner Mongolia. And the fourth is that China should not agree to giving a port to any other great power. In the negotiations after the submission of the 21 demands, Japan's hand is strengthened because the other great powers of Europe are preoccupied with events to the West. Britain and Russia, who might have come to China's aid, are totally preoccupied with the war in Europe, and they're effectively colluding with Japan in Japan's behavior. The upshot is that the Sino-Japanese Agreement of May 1915 accepts all but one of the four major demands, the one that is not accepted as the future of Tsingtao, which is left to be decided at the peace conference at the conclusion of the war. The wishes are rejected, but Japan still has all to play for, because within China, people are divided. There are still the nationalists looking to Japan for help, because they are Asiatic powers, and Yuan, the president of the republic, is now thinking that perhaps the best solution for China is to abandon the neutrality which it had declared at the beginning of the European war in August 1914, and instead become a belligerent so it can be a more effective negotiator. President Yuan has also got another agenda, which is that he wants to become the new emperor of China, and he's hoping that the great powers might endorse that aspiration. Japan, of course, doesn't want China to increase its leverage, and because of Japan's strong position in Asia, it is able to prevent the other great powers from endorsing Yuan's ambitions. Yuan, President of the Republic, abandons his hope of becoming the new emperor of China and then himself dies in 1916. Japan had signed up to the Declaration of London. This was an agreement between Britain, France and Russia on the 5th of September 1914, which said none of them would come to a separate peace with Germany. 
So Japan's therefore also guaranteed its place at the end of the war in the peace negotiations. Despite what seems to be a wholehearted commitment to the war against Germany, Japan actually strongly resists all pressure to send ground troops to the European theatre. The most it is prepared to do is to send a naval flotilla to the Mediterranean. So it's fighting what we might now call a limited war, and given the withdrawal of the European powers from the Asian economy, Japan's industrial growth is phenomenal. Its exports double between 1912 and 1916, and its industrial production grows five times between 1914 and 1919. Much of that depends on the raw materials and the resources that it's drawing out of China, particularly iron and coal. So it's sucking resources out of China. That's then enabling Japanese heavy industry to grow. And as Japanese heavy industry grows, so its exports multiply. The consequence of this growth is that Japan increasingly has an interest in China too becoming a belligerent. If China's in this war, that will increase its dependence on Japan, that is Japan's calculation, and also enhance the war against Germany, which is the rationale for Japan being in this war in the first place. In August 1917, China abandons its policy of neutrality and finally enters the First World War. And it does so in the wake of other powers, particularly the United States. The fact that the United States becomes a belligerent in April 1917 produces a whole raft of further actors who realize that for a minimum military contribution, they're going to be able to extract, they hope, maximum leverage at the peace negotiations. So now, after 1917, both Japan and China have earned their right to be present in Paris in 1919. In the event, they're both disappointed. Japan does indeed get the mandate over Tsingtao, over the Shantung Peninsula, over what had been the German naval base, and that infuriates Chinese nationalists who see this as part of Chinese territory. The effect is to provoke disapproval of Japan in China throughout the 1920s. But what Japan does not get is the clause which Japan wanted to be inserted in the Covenant of the League of Nations, which laid down the principle of racial equality. The anti-Japanese feeling in the United States, the fear of a yellow peril around the Pacific, which not only infected Americans, including Canadians, but also infected Australia and New Zealand, is mirrored in the decision of the other great powers not to recognize the principle of racial equality. And Woodrow Wilson, the president of the United States, himself from the South, endorses that stance. What is striking is that the collapse of the League of Nations is the responsibility of the frustrated victors of 1918, not the disappointed defeated of 1918. It is not Germany that causes the collapse of the League of Nations in the first instance, it is Japan. In 1931, Japan occupied all of Manchuria and established a puppet regime. It put on the throne the last Manchu emperor, who had been a child in 1911 when the Manchu dynasty had collapsed. In 1933, the League of Nations demanded that Japan withdraw from China and impose sanctions on Japan until it did so. Japan's response was not to withdraw from China, but to withdraw from the League of Nations, and it had been a member of the League's permanent council. Here was a victorious power itself tearing up the agreement that had been reached in Paris. In 1936, a second member of the permanent council of the League of Nations, Italy, decided to invade Abyssinia, Ethiopia, as it became. The League imposed sanctions on Italy, and in 1937, Italy's response was to withdraw from the League of Nations. So the system of collective security, which had been created in the aftermath of the Great War, collapsed in the 1930s. And that collapse began not in Europe, as so many seem to imagine, but in Asia. That argument can be taken one stage further. The Second World War began not in 1939, but in 1937, when the hostility between Japan and China flared into open conflict. We tend to look 
at the discontinuities in European history from 1914, the outbreak of the First World War, the collapse of the European empires, the rise of Hitler. These are big changes. But what we too often neglect is the continuities provided particularly by Japan within Asia. Japanese ambitions in China are there from 1914. And what gets added in 1914 is Japanese Pacific and maritime ambitions as well. In 1937, that results in war in China. By the end of 1941, Japan takes the decision to expand its empire in two directions simultaneously. It's already fighting a major war in China. It now adds a further ambition to expand into the Pacific and extend its maritime empire as well as its continental empire. On the 7th of December 1941, the Japanese Navy attacks the US Pacific Fleet in its base at Pearl Harbor. And so begins the war between the United States and Japan. In 1914, the Japanese Navy had measured its strength against the Navy of the United States. It had used that as a benchmark. In 1941, Japan's imperial ambitions led it into war with the United States, the greatest power in the world. This was a war Japan could not win. With Japan's defeat in 1945 came the loss of its empire, an empire which had embraced much of modern China and had extended as far south as Papua New Guinea. That brings us to the end of our series, Peacemaking in Paris, with Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. It was a Chrome Radio production for UCL Institute of Education. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. Thank you for listening.